All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a butt. You might be familiar with this highly practical multifunctional body part. However, did you know that in Elden Ring, you can actually use your butt as a weapon by using the ground slam Ash of War. So what would it be like to go through the game by only doing damage using your backside? In other words, can you beat Elden Ring with only this particular Ash of War? Well, technically there's also a holy damage version, two of them in fact, which is poetic since we established in the previous video how ass holy damage can be compared to the other damage types. Regardless, let's just restrict it to the regular ground slam. Whatever the results may be, at least we can say that this is a very cultural type of run. So put down your copy of Plato's Symposium for a while, because this is the Elden Ring ass only challenge. And it's also nice to know that I'm the first one who Oh, cheeky bastard. Yeah. Anyway, here's the video. My character's alias for this run will be the name of the main character of the scientific documentary known as Keijo. And let's just start off as the rat's origin for extra class. We can only use our club for clubbing the dung beetle that provides us with the ground slam Ash of War, as we cannot start with a butt attack after all. However, even though we cannot use it as a weapon anymore from now on, given that Ashes of War need to be applied to our weapon, the club's damage output is still relevant as Ashes of War don't merely skill with weapon upgrade level, but also the weapon's AR. Although as far as I can tell, at least for this Ash of War, only the physical damage counts. Meaning that split damage will not provide more damage output, even though the AR is higher. So the holy version might be different, and a weapon with higher base damage and scaling may very well make your Ash of War do more damage as well. However, this run isn't about the weapon itself to begin with, and I tend to have a stick up my butt anyway when it comes to how I approach these runs. Now, I did want to try it out unupgraded against the Tree Sentinel, but, uh, well, I think you can agree that this was kind of a half-assed attempt. Well, at least I did make sure that the wife got a good view, after all, she is going to marry it one day. But I think it's better to just start off collecting all the basics. Seeds, tears, the lift medallions, Radigan seal for some extra levels. And of course, we went for Leonia, especially for upgrade materials, which can be easily accessed by skillfully avoiding lobster attacks. And as you likely already know, you can run through the mine there for easy access to smithing stones while skillfully avoiding all the magic attacks. In fact, after patch 103, you can even buy smithing stones from the merchants, meaning you don't even need the smithing stone bell to get 12 stones of each. On top of that, if we go to the Altus Plateau early, we can acquire the second smithing stone bell. And we could even get more high level stones in this area, but let's not overdo it, we'll save that for later. Also, there's a bunch of seeds to pick up, and remember that this move requires FP, Meaning that we need to sacrifice healing flasks the more attacks we need. Also, I was actually wondering about something when I was here, because Market shows up if you ride through this area. But does that also happen when you haven't fought him yet during his first encounter? And the answer is surprisingly yes, yes he does. Interesting little detail, but we are going towards his first encounter first of course. Now, near the Windmill Village you can find the Noble Set, and the Blue Hood gives you one extra level in mind. But as practical as that may be, given that it covers up my character's backside, I would imagine that people would have moral objections to me wearing this garment. However, I did realize that it wouldn't be very respectful to have my character run around in her underwear, so I did decide to purchase some appropriate attire for her. Oh, there we go, much more dignified. So with that done, I think it's time to test the power of our posterior. Oh wow, that's actually a pretty damn hard-hitting hiney. Now regardless, there are also some downsides to using your backside. The move is slow, has lots of recovery time, and doesn't provide you with any iframes. And although it can be used to avoid certain ground attacks, like you can do with a regular jump, it also has a very slow startup animation, making it a very risky attack that will be hard to squeeze in between the rapid and aggressive combos of most boss fights in this game. Now speaking of boss fights, although this run covers the standard any percent route, just like the previous video, I don't want to keep doing that, given how much content there is in this game. So for the next challenges, we are going through the game using different routes. In fact, some runs will actually require that. But our first boss will be Market, like usual. And yeah, he has some extensive combos, but he also leaves himself open during certain attacks. Which in principle allows us to squeeze in our slow butt slam. And to be fair, not only do we get some really nice damage out of our killer keisters, and we can also do some heavy posterior posture damage, However, I did immediately notice two problems that would become worse the further we would get into the game. First is the fact that it's really hard to aim your jump, because it already feels kind of random, especially if you do it immediately after rolling. 
And then it's also affected by the movement and hitbox of the boss. Which means that you can land exactly where you don't want to land. And the second problem is the RNG of follow-up attacks. Because this attack has so much recovery time. Which can either lead to some nice hitbox porn, where the follow-up attack of the boss goes over your head because you're sitting down. But it can also mean that a safe opportunity for you to attack depends not on the boss's current attack, but on what he happens to follow up with. Which is often not predictable as bosses can follow up in multiple ways. So for a lot of the fights in this run, it basically turned into a guessing game for the most part. Well, at least we managed to show Market that warrior blood truly flows through our fanny. And of course, to the victor belong the spoils, so let's collect our booty, namely a talisman slot. However, if you want the best type of talisman for this run, you really have to be an ass. Because that will require us to kill Pot Buddy. After all, he drops the Jar Warrior Shard, which boosts the power of skills and... Wait, what? What the fuck? He's gone? Wait, so Alexander automatically frees himself after you defeat Market? I honestly didn't even know that. Well, you cannot perform any attacks in Redman Castle, and doing his entire questline, which would actually give you an even better version of the talisman, but that's not part of the route. Moreover, his all behind is uh, getting clobbered enough as it is. So I decided to leave him be and go for the next best thing, namely the blue dancer charm. And that merely requires us to defeat the guardian golem. And fortunately, he doesn't have that much health. You see, he already goes down. Uh, wait, what? Oh, come on, look at the life bar. Well, as I was saying, we get the blue dancer charm from defeating him, which gives a damage boost at low weight. However, I was also wondering about another talisman. And since I thought it was more theme appropriate to enter the castle through the back door anyway, I made sure that Gostok would butt out and not lock us in with the knight where the key is. And yes, as some people pointed out, if you keep him alive, he will sell an ancient dragon stone later on, but we only need one of those to begin with. But what I was wondering about is whether or not the Claw Talisman would boost the damage of the Butt Slam. After all, it's a jump attack in a sense. But as you probably already expected, that only applies to actual jumping attacks, not skills that just happen to cause you to jump. Well, speaking of jump attacks, and what I said before against Market about this challenge turning fights into a guessing game, yeah, I guess that Godric does jump attacks a little better than I do. Well, you do have to guess, but don't assume, because that will make an ass out of you and me. But regardless of tanking some damage, I went through his first phase rather quickly. However, remember what I said about the inability to control the direction of my butt slam? Well, during his phase transition, it decided to put me right underneath his axe. Isn't that marvelous? So then I not only needed to refill my FP, but I also needed to heal. Unfortunately, I selected my empty flask of physic, so uh, yeah, I guess I made an ass out of myself. Fortunately, I did not make that same mistake twice. Well, the healing, that is. Oh, and remember the dancer charm that gives you a boost based on weight. And the fact that I'm kind of needlessly holding a shield that makes me heavier. And that I'm kind of not really using to begin with. And you would think that would not make an actual difference, but... Uh, well, you would be wrong. Now, I did get lucky, though. But you would think that this would teach me to not unnecessarily carry a shield. Or, if I do, actually use it from time to time. Well, you would be wrong again. So after assassinating the king of the castle, we get a great rune, but as a rule, I don't use those in my challenge runs. Mainly to cover up for the fact that I simply always forget that that's a game mechanic. Now before we continue, I think it will be appropriate to cite some words of wisdom of one of the great visionaries of this century. Oh, and in regards to my own ass, let me put a monocle in front of it. Okay, there we go. Now, let me quote the famous poet Sir Mixalot. <coughs> I like big butts and I cannot lie, you other brothers cannot deny. Alright, let's continue with the next area, and that would be the Magic Academy. And of course that entails getting chased by multiple dogs near the elevator. But as a noble adventurer, we cannot let that deter us. And fortunately, especially because of the shockwave, we finally have a sort of effective way of dealing with dogs. At least it is quite efficient if you don't use it... Uh, well, near a latch. Yeah, uh, as I said, it's hard to aim this attack, and as my bathroom floor can attest to, my aiming skills are already quite poor. And speaking of fast-moving jumping canines, now it's our butt versus air butt. Okay, my references are getting a little bit obscure, I think. 
And believe it or not, I actually, well, almost used my shield, but decided to dodge at the last minute instead. So I got close to using it at least. However, I did not get close to hitting the wolf because uh, he moves faster than me. So basically, I could only hit him if he happened to do a follow-up attack rather than jumping away. However, that would mean receiving damage right after dealing damage. Or just trying to hit him by attacking randomly. So those prospects made me pretty bummed out. Fortunately though, this boss has surprisingly way less health than the previous bosses. So despite tanking hits while fighting him in my underwear, I'm in my very dignified outfit, I still managed to take him down first try. Simply by using my skill. In the sense of using my Ash of War, because I mainly relied on luck. Well, I may be the one putting my butt in people's faces, but I was getting balls in mine. But what to expect when I got an endless stream of comments on my previous video telling me to keep looking at balls. Goes to show how much class there is among my audience, by the way. Well, at least I wasn't worried about getting through the first phase of the Ronaldo fight. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. But uh, sitting on their faces made me worry about the age of the Sailor Scouts. I mean, given how young these girls look, I was kind of worried that Chris Hansen would walk in to tell me to have a seat on that stool over there. You have a nice ass, baby, you ask. She says, I don't know, it's behind me. Now, Ronaldo herself would seem straightforward as well. However, you cannot just spam your ass through this fight, because she tends to jump backwards when you attack her, and then she will likely send your ass back to the last grace. Regardless, we are doing good damage, and one of the benefits that these harmful hindquarters have is the ability to outright flatten her with a direct hit. However, even though we have hyper armor, which goes through the shockwave caused when she summons, she has hyper armor as well. And you definitely want to get your ass out of there when these extra enemies are after it. Oh, and to be clear, you have to be already in the animation to hit her while she summons, otherwise you will still get knocked back, obviously. But with a little patience, we can show her that we are in fact the true queen of mooning. <laughs> yeah, to be your naughty girl, aren't you? Oh, uh, well, after defeating the second shard bearer, uh, we get another talisman slot at the round table. So that means that we should obviously acquire a new talisman. And north of the lift in the Altus Plateau, we can acquire one that provides a 10% damage boost at full health, which requires us to defeat a boss that, uh, well, uh, exist. That existed. Not sure what else to say about this one. However, although this talisman is good in principle, same damage boost as the warrior shard, but given how easily we take damage in this run, we won't get that much benefit out of it that often. But at least we don't have to kill Alexander for it. I mean, viciously slaughtering everything else is fine, of course. So that is a nice damage boost, but I don't want to overdo it. So I first went for the Draconic Tree Sentinel, before gathering more upgrade materials. I'm already doing decent damage enough, after all. However, here again we see the problem that I mentioned before. That attacking in this run is like a guessing game, because whether you will take damage or not depends on what the boss happens to do after you get an attack in, given the long recovery time before you can move again. So there is a lot of RNG involved in these fights. However, I did notice that you are very much better off attacking his shield side, because even though he can attack with his shield, it doesn't have a shockwave, and you tend to get more opportunities to safely get away compared to his weapon side. Also, he tends to flinch a lot, which can save you from taking damage. So although it was still RNG heavy, I did at least have some sort of a strategy this time. And therefore it didn't take long before his inevitable death by Derriere. So after that fight and gaining access to the capital, I thought it was about time to gather some more upgrade materials. So now I did pay a visit to the old and new Altus tunnels, and in the capital itself there are a few stones as well, and that should be more than enough for the shade version of Godfrey. After all, he doesn't have that much health given where he is placed in the game. Now normally I would do jump attacks to not only avoid his ground stomp, but to also simultaneously get an attack in. But even though the butt slam is technically a jump attack, given how slow it starts up, and the long recovery time, that would not be a very smart approach. Unfortunately, that does mean that you have very few attack opportunities. Sometimes he does an overhead attack where he slowly pulls his axe out of the ground, or even a jump attack where he stabs his axe into the ground, 
But those attacks are rare. So the best opportunity is when he spins the axe around. In fact, despite the long recovery time of the butt slam, you can react just in time to avoid the incoming AoE. The only problem is that normally he does that spin all the freaking time, but in this particular fight he did it really infrequently. Which might have something to do with me not doing jump attacks over his ground stomps, like usual. So for the majority of the fight, I was just dodging and waiting for him to finally do the spin attack. So all in all, not a difficult fight, but quite a bit more lengthy than usual. At least it did make me hopeful for the second encounter with the actual Godfrey, but as it turned out, there are some changes even in the first phase of that second encounter that actually make a very meaningful difference. Now, something that makes a meaningful difference as well is another appropriate talisman. Now, of course, the shard from Alexander would have been the most functional, but other than damage, there's also FP to take into consideration. And if you go through the beginning of Blight's questline, you'll get the ability to purchase the carrying crest from the giant blacksmith, which lowers the FP consumption of skills. Also, in case you wonder, yes, you can still use the butt slime without FP, but it will do reduced damage and no longer produces a shockwave. So, preferably, you don't want to do that. And therefore, FP consumption is highly relevant. But now we have another sort of rematch, namely with Margot. Although his actual name is Morgoth, brilliant way to disguise yourself, would be a bit like me going by the alias uh, push select or something. But regardless, although there are similarities, his moveset is quite different this time, with even longer combos and even less opportunities where he leaves himself open for a counterattack, for an extended period of time at least. Well, at least the start is easy enough, because you can trigger his jump attack by staying at a distance and waiting for a spear throw. If you avoid it, he almost always follows up with the jump attack. At least, initially. Because after he gains the Sword of Damocles attack, he will rarely follow up his spear throw with a jump attack. Instead, he will mostly follow up with a spear charge. Which is punishable with a fast melee weapon. You can roll through it and do a quick roll attack on the still. However, that's not exactly applicable to the butt slam. So, I thought about making use of the fact that the spear throw has a safe zone right in front of him. Unfortunately, that's also one of those RNG examples where it could be safe, but that depends on his follow-up attack. And the moment you jump, you don't know if his next attack will go over your head or not. So yeah, basically the second phase came down to gambling again. Now, when he transitions into his third phase, you can get an attack in if you're brave enough, since there are random explosions around him. However, then I always wait for either version of his blood sword attack. But the problem is that he recovers too quickly when using the butt slam. Or better said, he might, making it a gamble again. Now fortunately, if you land behind him, he tends to do the tailspin, and that one goes over your head. And although it is rare, he can still do the jump attack after a spear throw. But all in all, the final phase went on for a long time and required a lot of patience and luck. So when I ran out of healing items near the end, I definitely needed some favorable RNG to save my ass from having to do it all over again. Hey, Morgoth, remember the trouble you gave me on my first playthrough? Look. Look at this. Look, this. This here. This. This defeated you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a kiss. You know you love it. Alright, so after ravaging Morgoth with our rump, it was time to head off into the mountains, where I made sure to pick up the bell to buy the remaining smithing stones number 6 that I still needed. And there are also some number 7s in this area. For example, in Castle Sol, there are a few enemies around, but I don't really give a rat's ass. And also, it would be nice to upgrade my flask with another sacred tier. Which does imply getting invaded by an NPC, and although I lost that fight, I must say that we were at least um, uh, pretty evenly matched, I must say. Uh. Now, the fight with the giant was actually pretty straightforward, for the most part. Now, to be fair, he's always a pain in the ass because of the camera, but at least he's not ass resistant. In fact, we are doing really good damage against him. Now, of course, when he summons the orb, you will need to get your ass out of there, or else you will get put on the backside burner. And you would think that would happen in the second phase as well, while attacking his hands, but you can actually get an easy knockdown this way. Although you cannot perform a critical attack on his eye, nor will you do more damage to it than to his hands, ironically. In fact, it's even less damage for some reason. So I guess he doesn't like what he sees, because my ass isn't big enough for him. So I guess next time we'll have to invite your mama to fight him instead. So all in all, you have to be very patient in this phase, because you get very few attack opportunities, and if you try to attack his remaining leg, you will probably crack your crack before you crack him. So other than the Firestorm, the People's Elbow, 
or the Hulk Smash attack are your best bet. But in the end, not even the ginormous giant could withstand this gluttonous Maximus massacre. Oh, by the way, as some people pointed out in my previous video, From Software did attempt to fix the stake of American Skip to get early access to the snowfield by including an automatic dev cam. However, they failed to do so, because if you jump far enough, despite the dev cam activating, your character will still fall all the way to the bottom, <laughs> bottom, and uh, thereby activates the stake of America down there. So it is possible that with a later patch they will succeed in fixing it, but at the moment it still works. However, there is something you can do from here that they did successfully patch. However, there's a workaround for that one as well, namely cheesing Moke, the Lord of Blood. Now getting there does require you to flatten an NPC invader to activate the portal, and although it does cover up my backside, but by combining it with the Albridge hat and mating gloves, I must say that I actually kind of like this fashion. However, it doesn't really fit the theme of the run. At least so I thought. Until I remembered this little blast from the past. Witch, wicked witch, witch of the ass. <laughs> wicked, wicked witch. <laughs> wicked witch of the ass. Yeah, so from now on these are the ass ventures of the wicked witch of the ass. Oh, quite marvelous indeed. So after you go through the portal, you get to a place where the sun don't shine, apparently. But then you can simply go towards... Oh, fuck, not good. <laughs> okay, save myself. Come on! I know fall damage isn't actually inconsistent in this game, but it sure as hell feels like it most of the time. Anyway, then we can simply ride towards Moke's palace. Very easy, just skillfully dodge the skeleton's projectile. And then when you get to Moke, if you want to cheese him, you need to first activate the fight, and then quit out so that the fork wall is up. And then... Well, it seems at least that From Software did manage to successfully fix this cheese tactic by moving the gravestone back a bit. I don't know if they failed here as well and there is still a way to do it, but it doesn't even matter, because there's an alternative method. If you go down the sewers in the capital, you can acquire the Moke Shackle. Very easy, just skillfully dodge the lobsters projectiles. And then you will need to use it three times in front of the fog gate. So, Tress, Duo, Unos. And then when you go through the fog wall, Moke will do exactly in the heel, because his AI will be frozen. Well, as long as you don't break his posture, because that will reactivate his AI. But you can prevent that by just leaving pauses in between attacks. Also, I don't think Moke enjoys this, because lore-wise, he apparently only likes young boys. Let us pray that the Turtle Pope isn't like that as well. Also, you can use a gold-pickled foul food before he dies for extra ruins, meaning you will get over half a million of them, which definitely gives your stats a nice kick in the pants. Alright, so the next area is Farumazula, But for the most part, you can just run through here and uh, then, uh, then, uh, what the fuck? What the hell is this awful smell? Oh no. What the fuck, dude? Someone dumped their ass all over my floor. Oh my god, that is disgusting. What were they thinking? Banal? Banal? Quick, get the pooper scooper. All right, I'm gonna clean up this mess. There is a, a shit on my floor. In the corner, there is a shit! THERE IS A SHIT ON MY FLOOR! Well, or, or is the floor on the shit, is what Kierkegaard would say. But fortunately now we go from one of the worst boss fights ever to one of my favorite boss fights in the game. And under normal circumstances, the second phase is the real difficult part. But this time the Beast Clergyman phase was the bigger obstacle. Because he doesn't really give you an opportunity to get a safe, slow jump attack in. In fact, even during his most vulnerable attack, when he does the sideswipe, it's still too quick for my butt slam. However, then I discovered that jumping into that attack can cause his movement to push you outside of the hitbox. But then I also discovered that the opposite can happen, where he pushes you right into his dagger. Not merely a timing issue, but also an angle issue. And we know by now how random that can feel with this attack. So I could get damage in, but it was very hard to control whether I would take damage from it as well. And during the successful attempt, I wasn't so lucky. And therefore I had to play it a bit safer in the second phase. Now he does leave himself open when he does the slow overhead attack, but the problem there is that he can follow up with the multi-slash attack. You know, the weapon art of his blade. And although he does have the tendency to alternate between doing that follow up and not doing that follow up, that is not at all guaranteed. And you have to react immediately if you want to get to his side in time to both avoid the slashes and to turn it into an attack opportunity. Because you can also avoid it by running away, but then you cannot attack him of course. And I suppose he was feeling very trollish today, because he was not alternating as he usually does. So because of my fear of the multi-slashes, I missed a lot of attack opportunities. 
In other words, I basically had to wait for him to do the multi-slashes, just to be sure. But despite all of that, not even the bearer of death itself could stand up against the destructive power of our devastating dumper. Well, the fight against Auto Omniscient can basically only go two ways. Either you beat him easily by spamming, or he beats you easily by spamming. And unfortunately, because I'm using FP, I couldn't just keep attacking. So I got quite lucky when I needed to both heal and refill my FP. In fact, looking back at the footage, I got more lucky than I realized at the time, because he somehow failed to cast a spell right before the end, as if he was out of FP. I guess I'm not familiar enough with the fight to know exactly what happened there, but apparently there are factors that can prevent him from casting as well. And it's a good thing that they beat him first try, because if you die, you no longer get first move advantage. And that can turn the fight into quite a mess. So then we had the rematch against Godfrey, so you would think that at least his first phase wouldn't be that much of an issue, since it's very similar to his Golden Shade version. However, there are also some differences. You can pretty much take the same approach as before initially, but after a while he will gain the ability to do the arena-wide AoEs. And whereas before you could recover just in time to avoid the incoming ground stomp, but the arena-wide version comes out much quicker. So initially I thought that I couldn't avoid taking damage anymore. But fortunately it wasn't that dire. You can still avoid them, but the timing becomes very strict. You need to initiate the butt slam a bit earlier than before, and then dodge as soon as you can. Then it's at least possible to avoid these quicker AoEs. However, his second phase is different altogether. He might move a bit slower, but obviously I didn't want to jump straight into his grab attacks. After all, I didn't want to get my ass handed. And doing a butt slam right after can mean that you, well, that you won't get your butt kicked, but your face instead. Ironically, his scream attack, that is meant to push you away, is actually an attack opportunity this time. Because this move has hyper armor, which prevents you from getting knocked back. But other than that, I was taking a lot of damage in his face. And on top of that, I was just playing sloppy and starting uh, to stack mistake upon mistake. So when I got close to victory, but ran out of healing items, I did get a very tight sphincter indeed. By the way, it's actually pretty interesting that this fight functions so well mechanically, given that the boss is clearly in an alpha state. So now the end is in sight, but we're not there yet. We still have Radagon and the Elden Beast back to backside before we can finish the playthrough. Now surprisingly, my first attempt went very well. My damage output was way higher than expected. And in Radagon's first phase, you can not only safely attack him from behind when he does a hammer attack with an AoE, you do have to make sure that you don't jump into that AoE of course, but then his hammer swings will also go over your head during your recovery time. However, the second phase is a different story. That's one hell of a mess. It already is in any playthrough. I don't think I ever went through this phase, by the way, without saying how the hell did that still hit me? With all emphasis on the word still. However, as well as this attempt went, the moment the Elden Beast did his stupid beehive attack, it was all over. What were they thinking when they designed that attack? So first I decided to get some more golden seeds for another flask. And for my flask of wonder physic, I first went to the Urtri avatar in the Weeping Peninsula for a Battle of the Buds, given that he drops the shield tier. However, that one was actually completely useless in combination of the tier that did make all the difference, namely the Crimson World tier, which can be found in the mountains near this latch. Easy to get, just skillfully dodge the magic bombs. And also, what is the opposite of getting your ass handed to you? Because that would describe this situation, methinks. But the thing about this tier is that it makes you immune to non-physical damage for a short time. In fact, it will actually heal you. 
So that is a very effective way to deal with the Elden Stars. So, next attempt, I first bot slam my way through Radagon. And as I said before, the first phase is not a big deal. Second phase became quite messy, of course. And I took quite a bit of damage. And the inevitable yelling of how did that still hit me. Regardless, I had sufficient healing flasks left. And of course, my flask of wonders physic. So now, it was simply time to finish this playthrough. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's time to defeat the true final boss. The camera. And uh, of course, the Elden Beast along with it. So for this one, let's just watch the entire fight.
And there we are, a piece of ass and a piece of cake. Well, not exactly that, but it was not as hard as I expected. And ironically, much more effective than holy damage. Also, what the fuck is this? Why is my character all dirty? This has been such a cultured and dignified run, and the game treats my character like she's a dirty girl. Come on, From Software, you cannot spell class without ass. Regardless, that's how you can beat every single boss in... <laughs> yeah, not exactly. But we did make it to the ending credits, using our butt as our only attack. However, the next video is going to be quite a bit more complicated, and will not merely cover the any percent route, and instead will largely go along the waifu route. All I can say about that one is that it's going to be a rainy day in the lands between. If you enjoyed this video, then consider liking, subscribing, and commenting. And if you want early access, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.